All right, thank you everybody for joining us today. Thank you for the folks that are live streaming here. My name is Devon Drew, founder and CEO of AcidLink. AcidLink is the first of its kind AI powered platform that connects asset managers, financial advisors, and accredited investors based off of characteristics, preferences, and attributes, creating a mutually aligned platform for fund discovery, engagement, distribution, and coming soon, transactions. Now, we want to welcome you to the 2024 Investment Management Distribution Forum. Now, we're very lucky today because we have a star-studded group of panelists that will be um, holding us down for the next 30 minutes, and then we'll open it up for 15 minutes of Q&A. So I would love to introduce the panelists uh, up to the stage here. So moderating live from GTS, your go-to lead market maker for ETFs, we have Naomi DePina. We have everybody's favorite CIO, Michael Batnick from Ritholtz Wealth Management. We have Jason Ray, CEO of Zenith Wealth Partners. We have Luke Oliver, Manager Director, Head of Climate and Strategy at Crane Shares. And we have Danielle Rutnick, Head of ET, uh, yeah, Rutsky, Rut 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 my, my apologies. Um, ETF product manager of NASDAQ. So once again, we're very fortunate to have them. Naomi will be moderating, but we encourage you all to ask questions about distribution and your strategy here going forward. So whether you're a financial advisor and allocator and you're looking for new differentiated investment solutions catered to what your clients needs, I encourage you to ask questions. If you're a fund manager looking for a distribution strategy or what's next or what trends you should be paying attention to, I encourage you to ask questions. So without further ado, I'd love to pass it along to Naomi. Thank you all. Everybody can hear me okay, right? Okay. So the fact that Devon trusted me with this mic, you all are in for it. Let me just say that. So thank you for coming. It's cold as hell outside. To get here was rough. Um, but you know what? I'm happy to be here. Everyone seems happy to be here. We're going to have a good time. I'm going to break a little rules, okay? Devon said questions at the end. Interrupt us. Ask us questions. We want to keep it alive. We want to gauge off of the questions you have as we have these phenomenal experts in the room. You know, and I can, I can chime in here and there as well from a, from a trading and market making side. So my name is Naomi DePina. I work at GTS. We're an ETF market maker. We're also a wholesale market maker meaning that we list equities. You see us often at NASDAQ, New York Stock Exchange, and SIBO. Um, my job is to make sure that we tie in distribution into everything we do with trading. So in the, in the conversation today about the 2024 investment outlook and distribution, the two go hand in hand. Yes, we can have all these ideas on investments, but how do we give that to the end client? Um, so all of our jobs here are connected in some funny way. And I'm excited to talk about it. But first, let's have everyone introduce themselves so our audience can get to know you. Um, let's start with Danielle. Hi, I'm Danielle. Um, as uh, Devon mentioned, I am at NASDAQ ETF listings. And we have over 600 ETFs with 1.4 trillion uh, assets under management. And so we help uh, asset managers, other types of sponsors that want to list ETFs come to market so they can offer their strategy through the exchange traded fund vehicle and financial advisors like yourselves can offer it to their clients. Thank you. I'm Luke Oliver. Um, I run Climate Investments and I'm the head of strategy for Crane Shares. Crane Shares is an asset manager uh, primarily focused on ETFs and we have three disciplines. We're, we're, we're focused on China and emerging markets. We're focused on alternatives, so think, you know, trend-following commodities and, and uh, you know, option vol harvesting. And then where I'm really focused is our third pillar, which is climate. And uh, as we'll talk about that, that's really about the energy transition um, more than anything else that, that we're going through. So looking forward to it. Thank you. I'm Jason Ray. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and meet you all. It's great to participate with you guys on the panel, too. Um, thanks to Asset Link for making this happen. Um, like Devon mentioned, I run uh, our investment team at Zenith Wealth Partners and founded the firm uh, almost five years ago. Uh, we're a team of financial advisors that really are planning with our clients to manage their money to achieve their goals and objectives. 
We've got seven advisors up and down the East Coast, and we are really working to address racial and gender-based wealth inequality with our clients. So a lot of our clients are people of color, women, and, and institutions they love. So it's great to talk about how we can scale investment products in an equitable fashion to the clients who may have been underserved in the past and couldn't receive them. So thank you. Hello, everybody. My name is Michael Batnick. Uh, like Jason, I'm also a co-founder at a wealth management firm. We're based in New York City called Whitholz Wealth Management. We're 60 employees, around $4 billion uh, under management. I am uh, the managing partner there, and I also produce an obnoxious amount of content. I think I do uh, 11 podcasts a week, so you can find this on YouTube and all those places that you get your podcasts. So I'm excited to be here, uh, excited to speak on this panel, and thank you, Devon, for joining us. Awesome. Thanks, guys. So as you guys can see, we have a very diverse lineup of panelists here, touching different parts of the market. Um, but, you know, first I want to touch on 2024, an investment idea. We'll get into the distribution stuff and how that all connects. But thinking about 2024, I mean, let's just go off of 2023. 2023 was an interesting year. Working for a market-making firm and a trading firm, you know, the first two quarters were, were a little shaky, right? Um, and at the end, we're starting to see different trends evolve. Um, a lot of active managers rising to the scene, a lot of money going into active Active probably took in the most amount of flows. But then as we go into 2024, we're hearing all this stuff about crypto, spot, these ETFs, 11 ETFs have launched in crypto. Um, all over the map, we're hearing various things. Also, there are projections for the S&P. Some people see single digit growth. Some people are projecting 8%. JP Morgan's not really predicting any growth here. So varying conversations, varying topics. Mike, I want to start with you, and, and you know, you talk about this on your podcast, Animal Spirits, all the time. What are your thoughts on 2024? If you have a crystal ball here, let I do. Us know. I'm glad you asked. I actually did. I brought it with me. Uh, all right, I was I was sitting in this room in December 2022, so just over a year ago. It was me and Josh and uh, Guy, who is doing Fast Money now. Uh, Dan Nathan and Danny Moses. And I asked the audience, how many of you think that we're going to a, into a recession in 2023? And every hand in the room went up. Like, really, every hand in the room went up. And then I said, okay, how many of you think that six weeks ago, that was the bottom? How many of you think that was the bottom? Nobody raised their hand. Not a single person. And I would, I would have raised my hand. I didn't think that was the bottom. The point is that we as investors need to relearn the same lesson that we learn every six months is humility. Nobody knows where the market is going to go. Uh, last year in December, 100% of economists expected a recession. Again, understandably so. Like the Fed was desperately trying to slow the economy. What asshole, excuse my language, is like, they're not gonna be able to do it. Like, of course they were gonna, and they didn't. And they tried and it didn't work. And especially in a world where yield starved investors, right? How long was the Fed punishing savers? Finally, they stopped punishing savers by trying to crash the economy. Uh, but with 5% interest rates, nominal, but whatever, still 5%. On cash, with no volatility, and the full faith and credit of our military, like that was a really good option for people at the beginning of last year. And the irony of investing is like, look what happened. The S and P was up 26 percent. Like, oh, you want that safety? That's cute. 26 percent, and the Nasdaq was up 56 percent the best year since 1999. I didn't feel like that to me. I don't know about you guys, but did that feel like the best year since 1999 for the NASDAQ? Now, of course, you can't talk about 2023 without talking about 2022. We basically round tripped. We got all of the losses back. But the point is that as I think about like market outlooks, I'm like, I have opinions like everybody else. Like, I think that the market's got 20% this year. Do I believe that? No. Like, uh, is it a lot easier to be up here and be like, listen, here are the risks. Yes, yes, I could, I could scare, scare the shit out of everybody with the best of them, but that I don't think it's productive. It's not a good use of anybody's time. There are always risks. I think whatever risks exist, 
the market is going to know about it way before any of we do. So my whole like belief is that markets are completely unpredictable. Crazy shit happens. It's not going to be commercial real estate. Like we all know it's always, the risk is not what we're talking about. And I'm almost done. It's always what you don't see coming, like just by definition. So the way that I think about investing is prepare for a wide range of outcomes. Don't take too much risk. Don't be like stupid and greedy, um, but take enough risk, right? Like don't be seduced by cash and, you know, come what may. And you live with the ups and the downs. And as long as you are sober about the decisions that you're making ahead of time, then you'll be a successful investor. And if you don't have a plan, you're not going to be. It's really that simple. Thank you. Luke, I, I feel like you have some comments in there. <laughs> I, well, yeah. So, and, shaking his head. Yeah. I was like, I no, was no. like do you have something to say? Oh, no, I was, no, I was, I think I was probably nodding more than I was, I was shaking. But no, but it is, so hmm, there's, there's a lot there. So I was in the same boat or, maybe, or, or I did the same thing where I was like, this is zero risk and mid single digit returns risk and return that's absolute no-brainer and then yeah i sat there like probably lots of us were like i'm i'm you know it's that it's like the guy in casino you know someone you know you, you feel like you're losing money if you're only making half the money you should be making and but you have to remember so it, it almost makes me think most of us really don't care about risk and return we just care about return and we should keep remembering that that risk element five percent for free is much better than than seven percent with you know 30% drawdown risk. So, so that, that is important. So we should all be happy if we have loaded up on some treasury bills and if we've got some longer dated fixed income that we've low investment grade and treasury, we're gonna get that duration trade that Warren Buffett made all his money on you know, for the last 50 years. So, so we should be comfortable with that. The other thing that I wanted to comment on that you mentioned about active flows did well versus passive flows for the first time in a long time or relatively speaking. I don't even think about passive and active. I, I think that conversation is like long over. It's, it's allocation. And for large cap equities, you can be long, you can be long passive, that's fine. Is there some inefficiencies there? Not really, but there, you know, if somebody said, I'm just buying the, the, the Magnificent Seven, they would have done a lot better. But my point is, there are different allocations and they can be passive or active and they can be mutual funds or they can be ETFs. I actually don't think any of that matters that much. It's just about the allocations. And I think, I always go back to this, it was one of the, about 20 years ago, or it was probably about 15 years ago, so there's five years left in this story, I met a financial advisor and I was trying to sell him China and I was trying to tell him to currency hedge, invest internationally in currency hedge. And he said, we've just entered a structural bull and the last time this happened, it was an old guy, he said the last time this happened, equities just went up for 20 years. Why would I have anything but the fastest pony in the race? And it, and, and it just stuck with me. And I kind of left the room thinking, what am I selling all these alternatives for? And he was right. And that has, US equities have been the best place you could have been for the last 15 years. And so there's still some time left in that trade. So uh, all of that is to say, I believe it's getting the allocations right, the, the active piece or the passive piece or the wrapper, not that important. But I think you always want to have, you basically don't ever count the US market, you know, US equities out, always have that as your core, always kind of generally have a beta there. And then if, where, if you've kind of reduced your vol to the broader market by kind of being in that core position, then take some interesting alternative bets on the side. And I'm, I'm definitely going to talk about a couple of those alternative bets that you can make over the next year. I'm, I'm excited about the alternative bets, but um, to your point, it doesn't really matter what you're saying is it doesn't matter what kind of product you're in right as long as you have your allocations correct and you're having the right exposure some markets are lend themselves much more to an active manager than others mm -hmm. and so i don't think you can say i'm a passive guy or i'm an active guy it's if i'm in and i'm going to talk about carbon markets you might have a view on inefficiencies there or if you're in small caps versus large caps you might have passive for large cap and an active manager for small cap. So my point is, is each choice is in the, you don't have to, you know, we're in a very polarized world. You don't have to commit to, um, in other words, I don't think it's worth saying there's more passive being bought than active. Um, doesn't tell you anything about the asset allocation. Okay. No, that makes sense. Um, 
either Danielle or Jason, um, when you think about this, especially for end clients, so I'll start with Jason actually first on this. When you think about your end clients and you know the investment outlook, I, I assume from what you're hearing on this panel and what you've read um, and what you all study internally is similar. How do you deliver that to your end client? Um, that, that's, that's very interesting of how do they get this perspective? For sure. Well, I think there's a lot of noise out there, right? Everybody's got their own perspectives. And, um, you know, I can guarantee that this year there's a bunch of different outlooks. We have our own firm outlook, but I can guarantee there's going to be some story, right? Last year, it seemed like to the allocation piece, like everybody's talking about their fixed income allocation. Rates are moving everywhere. It's a volatile environment. Bonds are supposed to be safe. What's happening in my allocation? And then we see the start of the year, the 10-year U.S. Treasury was at 3.8%, and the end of the year was at 3.8%, like it didn't move. It was just a little bit rocky along the way. So I think patience is going to be critical this year. You know, coming out of 2022, to comment on our clients, we do a lot of work with endowments and foundations at our firm. You know, they have a certain spend rate. They've got to beat that spend rate and in inflation to exist in perpetuity, which is a mandate for a lot of them. Coming out of 2022, that looked tough to do, right? We had a high level of inflation. Markets dropped. They got to spend the same amount of money. That spend rate's up. So last year, they needed the returns of the market last year. And I think a lot of them, you know, uh, and others are sit looking at risk-adjusted returns in cash and like, well, why would I, you know, take risk and go out on the spectrum, extend duration, go in equities? But I think maintaining that allocation and saying like, look, yeah, risk-adjusted returns are great in cash now, but we need to invest for the next 10, 15, 20 years. Let's not reduce our exposure to longer duration or you know, uh, U.S. equities or more risky equities or emerging market equities because we need those sources of return for the long term. And, you know, really being there as a source of advice for clients and making sure they understand this year is not going to dictate the next 15 and staying strong in that allocation that we set on the front end is really is really a big part of our job. Thank you. And, Danielle, when you are, so you sit right in front of um, all the listings that are coming to the NASDAQ. And I think, you know, from what I'm hearing, this has been, the past couple of years have been the fastest growing, uh, this has been the fastest growing exchange. Um, speak a little bit to that of, you know, what trends are you seeing, considering the 2024 outlook and what you've seen in 2023, are you seeing certain launches? Are you seeing people stay away from certain asset classes? Anything exciting? Obviously crypto, but what else, you know? Yes, definitely uh, crypto has been a main topic over the past couple of weeks, but Launches for 2023 really aligned with what the rest of the panelists here have said. Um, risk is a main focus, and I think a uh, way that asset managers used to try to uh, adjust for risk and return used to be smart beta, but you've kind of seen smart beta launches quell in favor of more equity derivative type launches. So you're seeing defined outcome, defined risk, put right, buy right types of ETFs launching that use derivatives on top of well-known indexes like the NASDAQ 100 or S&P 500 to specifically target what their and investors' risk or return profile is like or the desired. Um, you're also seeing um, dividend ETFs taking in much smaller inflows. Um, tech and sector and style and growth ETFs are really still gathering a majority of the inflows. So, you know, the, the fear of in inflation that we saw from retail investors in a survey that NASDAQ does in 2022 has really um, kind of worn off in 2023. And we've seen that in terms of um, not only ETF flows, but also still ETF launches um, really diversifying across international uh, markets. And we're even seeing international uh, companies trying to now list in the U.S. to bring their domestic or home strategies into the ETF wrapper for U.S. investors as that appetite is growing. Um, and, you know, as Naomi mentioned um, last week, the SEC approved the uh, SC, uh, the spot Bitcoin ETFs. So they actually had some of the largest launch days in terms of value traded of any ETF launches out there. Uh, so they're, they're picking up a lot of interest and we're really excited to see where that goes in 2024, as well as continuing to see how options and derivatives can be utilized in the ETF wrapper. People are becoming really creative outside of just 
active versus passive, semi-transparent active, which uses you know, a little bit of a shielded basket as opposed to just showing your daily holdings every day of a transparent active ETF. Um, and we're really seeing the usefulness of the ETF wrapper come to fruition for asset managers and for their end clients so they can have every flavor of different investment profiles in any type of management style that is preferred. So, so Luke, I'm going to challenge you here a little bit because <laughs> Danielle's talking about ETFs, right? And I think that, yes, it's the fast-growing way, and there was a reason, too, for these new tokenization products to be in an ETF wrapper as well. You know, do you see in 2024 ETF growth continuing, or do you also see room in the market for, for some other types of investment vehicles that... Yeah, well, we're an we're a, uh, ETF asset manager. We definitely believe right. in, in the growth of ETFs. We, it's interesting, I just think it's because we are finding these very interesting spots in the market where we think there are inefficiencies that lead to opportunities um, that, you know, even though I said, you know, people maybe don't care about risk, risk weighted returns, but, but they do. And there's, there's interesting things you can do. But because of that, a lot of our clients are actually asking us about private funds as well. So as an asset manager, we're, we're not um, locked into ETFs as the only way to do things. We're not evangelists for ETFs. We yeah. happen to think they're the best technology. And so, so that's what, what I mean. I'm sort of agnostic on the wrapper. We'll use the best one. And it does happen to be ETFs most of the time. So um, we think ETFs will keep growing. We think that um, it, I actually think it's more idiosyncratic to us as we evolve more towards institutions and family offices and, and you know, large RIAs that we're picking up some of these, uh, this feedback that maybe we should offer some private funds as well. But no, ETFs are going to continue to just be the better technology and over time they'll replace more and more of the mutual fund bucket. Great. Thank you. Uh, and, and Mike, as a selector of ETFs um, at, at Ritholtz, you guys manage $4 billion in assets. Do you ever feel, you know, especially going into the 24, a lot of ETF launches, sometimes you have 10, for example, we just had 11 launches of the same thing, essentially, right? Is there a saturation point where it's like, okay, that's enough? And what are you looking for in those launches? Are you looking for liquidity in selection of an ETF? Because we have a lot of ETFs that do the same thing. Yeah, <clears throat> excuse me. So you're right. How many billion dollar S&P 500 ETF. So I don't, have? I think it's enough. I don't think we're getting any more new launches out of the index. I think that's, that's well pretty taken care of. But to Danielle's point, there's a lot of really interesting ideas coming to market. Uh, the defined outcome category. We had Bruce Bond uh, on the podcast in 2018 or 19. And I remember Ben and I were like, holy shit, this is going to be huge. This is going to be a monster category. And it's one of the best calls we've ever had because it was just obvious to us that investors love certainty. Uh -huh. And markets don't offer certainty. And sure, there's a price for that, not just the expense ratio, but yeah, you're going to give up some upside. That's fine. If investors can know before, before uh, they invest what their range of outcomes are, I mean, that's a, anyway, needless to say, that thing took off in a real way. Uh, Danielle also mentioned, like, a lot of the derivatives, the option overlay strategy. Uh, I think Jeppy is the largest active ETF, and I don't know, what is it, 30 billion, uh, 200? I mean, I, whatever, it's, it's huge, and it's not slowing down. Now there's a, the Nasdaq 100 has one, of course, so there are a lot of clever ways as far as what advisors uh, are looking for. I think it depends on the firm. Uh, a, lot of this, a lot of the success of these strategies is right place, right time. Remember the hack ETF back in the day? Uh, was right after all of that shit, and like it, it just right place, right time. It got a billion dollars in, in in short order. So I think that most people understand that uh, AUM is not equal liquidity. It's the underlying holdings, and not just what you see on the screen. So I think yeah. that's pretty well understood. Uh, and I think that investors are looking for more personalization. So I think that is going to be something that is, is advisors are going to. Uh, advice is going to give and clients are going to demand in the future. I'd also just try to, to just chime in. I mean, I feel like ETFs definitely are a great wrapper for investments, but right, like where people are going to be compensated to wrap products in many different ways, like that's Wall Street's job, right? So, you know, we're going to see different iterations of these products come out. I would love somebody to like explain why we'd recommend a client to buy a, a crypto ETF versus like open a Coinbase account and hold it directly. 
You know, some of these things like asset location and how efficient it is really does matter. And I think a lot of these asset classes are being duplicate, duplicated across like multiple wrappers that may not all like work the same for the client. The best strategy or something that seems like a no brainer for like a quant brain person who is like banging their head against the wall, like why won't people buy my product? The best product doesn't win. It's the best story. And I'm, you know, for better and worse, that's the way it works. And if people aren't buying what you're selling, it doesn't matter if you think it's better than the next strategy. If there's not a demand for your product, listen to the market or do something different. Yeah. And I'd, I'd love to add, I love that you mentioned uh, Bruce Bond because I, I talk about this guy as well because he was one of the guys behind uh, power shares, right? Invesco, like fourth, fifth yeah. largest ETF business in the world and retired. I, I knew those guys very well. I didn't know him. I, I kind of got involved with them just after him. But anyway, he then retires and he's out of the industry for 10 years, and then he comes back and starts something that nobody else is doing in ETFs and grows another multi-billion dollar business. And like, everybody should be embarrassed. Like, this guy did it once, went away, and then kind of, he must have been watching the thing going, ah, I'm gonna have to go back and show Actually, that's a great, his, so the Buffered ETFs that we're talking about, and Bruce founded a company called Innovator uh, ETFs, there's so many quant guys that are just brilliant and they're like, but you could do it like this, or like, why wouldn't you just buy an option? It's like, stop. You don't understand what business you're in. You're not in the let's create the best strategy that nobody can understand. Bruce figured it out. It's a great product. It's a great wrapper. It might not be optimized to the extent that some of these people would like, but it's easy. We get it. We understand there's trade-offs. Fine, you're not getting the dividend. Like, we get it. It's a great product. It's a great wrapper. It's a great innovation, and he's winning. And then, and, and then the second part to that is everyone's now talking Bitcoin. There's 11 new Bitcoin ETFs. Guess what? There was like five Bitcoin ETFs already. Anyway, it's not that newsworthy. They just weren't spot. Um, and I don't know if that's popular with everyone's comment, but then other people are like, well, what are you? Are you guys doing Bitcoin ETFs? No. What I'm thinking about is if someone, if the SEC has now allowed a new asset class into an ETF wrapper, what precedents have they just set? that opens up some other idea that nobody's thought of yet. So I'm thinking yeah. about what else can I now put into an ETF? And it's not another crypto token, it's something else. Well, I've got some ideas of what the something else might be, but that's how people should be thinking. So the ETF wrapper is gonna keep evolving and doing more things. And I think there's more than 10,000 mutual funds. So we don't need more passive S&P 500 ETFs, but there's another 7,000 ETFs potentially to, to do different things. So. Um, I just don't think there's a limit. It's just a wrapper to, to put a widget in, and good widgets are good widgets. 100%. And with these good widgets, Danielle, I think that you know you see a lot of launches that come to NASDAQ, and some, honestly, as a, as a lead market maker as well, we see a lot of success stories, like the buffer, and we also see a lot of failures. Um, what, what do you think makes that, you know, what is it dif what differentiates that? Is it distribution? Is it, you know, what you have behind it or the story, for example, of, of what Mike was saying? Yeah, um, there's a very popular saying now that ETFs are sold, not bought. Um, and marketing and distribution make or break an ETF. Um, the average ETF lifespan is about three and a half years. Um, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. Even as an exchange, a listing exchange, we like to see the market cleaning itself out and making sure that the products that are viable and healthy are the ones that are on the market. Um, but uh, we have done extensive research and surveys as to you know, what do retail investors want to digest in terms of marketing material, not just for ETFs, but for any type of investment vehicle. And oftentimes it's um, short form videos and articles. YouTube is extremely popular. Twitter and TikTok are increasing in popularity across all age groups. So there's, we're really entering this new age of the way that we communicate with our end investors. And NASDAQ sees itself as an extension of our issuers marketing team. And we have a really great team that helps um, the ETF issuers um, not just come out with a big splash, because I think if you, know, you really just focus on the launch of your ETF, there's a whole life cycle of the product beyond that that's really important to continue trying to reach new investors for. And um, you know, it, it's also not just the US. You know, as your product grows, a lot of issuers look to uh, cross-list or create an additional listing, whether it's a usage product in Europe or um, you know, a master feeder to Australia or Latin America or something like that. Um, so 
you know, we definitely um, expect more launches. I mean, we have 3,300 ETFs now, 40% more than there was five years ago, and the industry is expected to continue to grow. But we also expect more ETFs to delist at that same time. Um, and, you know, there's different thresholds for what makes an ETF successful. But, um, you know, you definitely have to have at least 50 beneficial holders still in an ETF to um, have regulatory uh, continued approval to, to remain listed on the exchanges. So um, it's really important to not only have a large amount of assets in your ETF, but to diversify that investment base. And uh, marketing is just so crucial and, and data that drives that. So we're really seeing data-driven distribution just ever growing. Key point there, ETFs are 100% sold. I came from State Street Global Advisors for five years. And, you know, even though it's State Street, the name sells itself, you still have to sell the, the sexy ETFs, right? And so that never ends. Luke, naturally, I need to come to you. Crane Shares, you guys started the business with something edgy, and you said, hey, China, here we go. But when you think of the alternatives you mentioned earlier, um, talk about your thought process on, in 2024, how that's going to resonate with investors. Is that something that yeah. you think will yeah. be successful? So, so yeah, thank you. It, it, and, I, and I think I was told not to mention exactly what tickers you should all buy, go and buy. But I, I, can, I, can, I, can, I can lead you there. We can ticker bit. just later, though. After, afterwards, I got my notes. Afterwards, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so everything we do at Crane Shares is that piece, right? So you've got your core. Yeah. And if you want to really create those exciting opportunities, to, to um, you, you've got some low correlation and you've got some big upside potential. You've got a place to kind of reduce not increase your overall risk and get some really nice, interesting stories. So the, the firm is built around investing in China and emerging markets. And K-Web is on CNBC nearly every single All day. Time, it's, yeah. it's, it's a very, we're very fortunate to have and uh, to have built a fund that is kind of almost gets seen every day and advertised by CNBC and Bloomberg and others. But its valuations are incredible in China, um, shifting political environment. Uh, massive cash on, cash on balance sheet, all the things that drove U.S. stocks, buybacks, all of that's starting to happen in the Chinese stocks in, in, K, in, in, our, in our flagship China fund that you'll find on our website, craneshares.com. But, but, the, 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 but the, the, the thing I really want to talk about is carbon markets. This is an asset class. Um, it's not niche. People, most of you are probably thinking, I've heard about the, uh, is this trees or what is this? It's not that. What it is, there's, there's the, the, the compliance carbon market is where some of the world's largest economies, so the state of California, the European Union, the UK, um, all of power production on the east coast of the US or the northeast coast of the US are all governed by these various carbon programs where there is a government-issued standardized unit so it's government-issued paper in California, uh, state-issued state paper, that is essentially a permit to pollute. And the way this works is it's, uh, it's how they solve acid rain, if you remember that, if you're, if you're old enough to remember Captain Planet and all of that. But basically what, what happens is, is you create a market for polluting. So if you pollute, you have to buy a permit, a carbon allowance. Um, it's not backed by trees or anything like that. It's literally a government permit. And they issue these, and what they do is they make it law that you have to buy them. They own supply, and like the central bank, they tighten. And that their way of tightening is how they push up the price and de-incentivize um, emissions. And what happens is, it, and it might sound a little socialist, a little overstepping, what it's doing is creating the innovation. Because you're putting a price on carbon, you're actually creating, there's actually an arms race between Europe, China, and the US to be the leader in renewable energy, you know, the Inflation Reduction Act. So policy and uh, government spending in all of these major economies is trying to become the leader in renewable energy. And renewable, don't think that's a woke term. Renewable just means infinite. Infinite, scaled, cheap energy is the ultimate goal. And so that's what, that's what we're trying to achieve with this, this carbon market. So why is that interesting? Well, it's an $800 billion market. It's not small, it's not niche. It's not unscalable. We, we run uh, the two, two of the largest carbon funds in the world. And one of them we invest in the global market, so Europe, California, Reggie in the UK. Reggie is the northeast of the US. And then we also have a California only. So if I have two more, a couple more seconds to tell you why this is so important. So just take the California market. They have a target to reduce emissions by 40%, and they are in the process of tightening that to a 48% reduction in California emissions by 2030. Mm -hmm. They issue 300 million permits. They are cutting that at a rate of 8%, and they're going to cut it at a rate of 11%. 
there is a liquidity. This is all a little bit technical, but and we'll keep it high level for everyone. Though. Keep it high level. Yes. Okay. California carbon allowances trade at forty dollars a ton today. Okay. Their net present value of their target, their supply, is fifty-eight dollars a ton. Mm. So in the next eighteen months, this is going to reprice from forty to about fifty-eight. And then ultimately, even the state of California says these are going to cost between 115 and 130 by 2030. So oh this is a very rare asset that is literally scheduled to move higher. California even adjusts the prices every year by 5% above CPI plus 5%. Um, so there's an animal spirits episode about this as well where we, where we get into it. But, um, and then you've got the European market, which is trading about $67. All the forecasts by 2030 are $130 uh, euros. And if you discount that back to today, we're looking at 30%, 40% returns over the next two years and 100-plus returns between now and 2030. Can I do that? I can. I, the, the California... <laughs> The California, you can get, well, I definitely cannot. My compliance officer would never let me say that. But with the California market, you can get pretty close to saying this is the price. They literally have a schedule, and that schedule puts it at about $58 right now, and yet it's trading at 40 So there's, there's a real opportunity there. Um, the, I, the, I'll go out on a limb, though. The California, and we have a fund that just does that, I think you've got a 30% upside uh, potentially uh, between now and the next 18 months. So an interesting investment idea for 2024, carbon, craneshares.com. Okay, there you go. Check it out. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's renewable energy is, is in many investment outlooks that I'm reading, but the fact that you guys have a solution for it, I think is unique, so for sure. I mean, personally, Jeez. I've never had to sell SPY to a client for their U.S. large cap exposure, so going back to the comment about ETFs. Hmm. Um, However, I think, to Michael's point, we all want something to sell. I don't just want to have people buy things from us. That was a good story, right? I mean, that's, I'm going to follow up. So. You, yeah, yeah so. for sure. I mean, as long as there's a story behind the ETF that makes sense logically with the business case of California, I think that that And it's that not sense. a 30% allocation. Yeah. You know, it's, it's a 6% it's a allocation. Devon's giving us the eye, guys. <laughs> The state of California is telling people what this is worth, and people are saying, oh, I'm not sure. We're going to see. It's, uh, it's going to so get there. So we're going to check on how much time we have. Yeah, Tom, I just had a question that came into the audience. Sure. This is a question for the allocators. So Michael and Jason, there's going to be people all around the room that say, hey, who wants to invest in the Chinese company? Who wants to invest in the Well, I don't have anything super profound to say. I just very simple, probably obvious advice is that people do business with people they like. And doesn't mean that somebody, you might be the greatest person in the world, nobody's going to buy a terrible product. But all else equal, if somebody likes you, they're going to find a way to work with you. And like it's really not that complicated now. Everything else is table stakes. You have to be smart. The fees have to be right. Like you have to have a good product. You have to be able to deliver. You have to tell them what you're going to do. Remind them, do it. Remind them again and do what you say you're going to do. There's not one silver bullet for success. It's all of those things. And if people like you, now you can't change your personality, unfortunately, for better or for worse. But that's that's the secret is is get people to like you. So I think. I think you. I think you got to do different stuff. Like, frankly, for an emerging manager, I think getting people to like you, there's structural and inherent bias that a lot of people have that allocate big money. 
that will never amount to them liking you. So doing di different things in order to get people's attention, I think is critical. There's actually an example here in the room. Uh, Bilal is a wholesaler and he does a great job. He came to the table and he said, look, I know you want to reach more clients. Like here's our fun solutions, but hey, I can help you get leads. No wholesalers ever said that to me, right? So I was like, all right, great. Well, let's have a conversation about how we can work this in the portfolio because I want more leads for our clients. Let me just add one more thing. Devon, you're, you're absolutely right. Just being a nice person is certainly not, not enough. Uh, you have to do something different, as Jason said. And I'll, I'll give an example that I got this week. I get a lot of emails, as does everybody else in this room. And one of them was from a fan. And I'm reading, I'm like, what? This just sounds weird. It sounds like somebody... Uh, it sounds like somebody, uh, like English is like not even like their third language. It just, it just read a little bit odd. And then I got to the end and he said, okay, that was all chat GBT. Now here's my story. And I said, you know what? That was clever. I, and so I took the meeting and I don't know that I can help this person, but it was enough. It was enough to say, you know what? That was clever. I'll give you, I'll give you 30 minutes. So uh, any way that you can do something like that, just differentiate yourself because it's all, just, it's all just the same stuff in the inbox. I, I just add, I'm on the other side of the fence, but everything I've talked about. Stop emailing me. All right, sorry. <laughs> everything we do, you can, a thousand, you can build a portfolio with this stuff with $1,000. So all of these, you know, part of that allocation thing we talked about is by making ETFs of these exotic things and interesting things, you're bringing them to those small portfolios. And that's where you know, ETFs can be, can be very powerful. One thing we do, and we know that, that you guys do it so well, and that's why we, we collaborated with you guys on occasion, is we need to multiply our voice. We, you know, you can only have so many people out meeting clients. You need to get people to read your content. We, we put a ton into research. So um, it's, there's, there's a multiplier effect. Both sides of the fence need to find that multiplier. Yeah, and other, just throw a couple of stats out there, um, findings that we had from our retail survey was that financial advisors are actually the most go-to and trusted source for investment information for retail investors. And so that means that they're looking for financial data that you guys have. Um, they're looking for financial publications that you guys might be able to share with them from uh, providers like the exchanges. So I love what Jason said about, you know, utilizing the wholesalers that are coming to you. They have access, the asset managers have access to the exchanges and we have access to data. So I would definitely lean on whatever sources you can to access more data that's going to help you um, synthesize, you know, not just what these products are in the ETF industry, um, but just investment uh, information as a whole. And I need to comment on this one as well because distribution for a lot of us on the stage and for a lot of you sitting in here that I personally know is, is what we do for a living, right? But there's two ways to look at this. First, first thing is with distribution in exactly what Devon said, and I think Mike, you commented, in getting in front of the right people is super difficult to do. Yeah, you can say something interesting. Yeah, you can be unique, right? But how do you find the right people in the first place? You're going to go to Google? Like, it doesn't work. Okay, so understanding and asking somebody for a favor is not the worst thing in the world, but also understanding, like Jason said, hey, what's something that they want? Because people don't want to help you for free. Nobody wants to help you for free. And that's something I've learned along the way, and I'm sure, Jason, that, that leads thing really got you at that moment, because you're like, hey, you're going to help me grow, I'm going to help you grow. You grow, we grow, has always been a motto of, of all the firms that I've worked with. And then the second thing is, we need to really take a part of ourselves. For us in this room, we have, we have a privilege to be in this room today. Um, a lot of us in this room, or many of us grew up not knowing what a credit card was, not knowing what savings was. Having a financial advisor is a privilege, okay? So understanding our privilege and understanding how can we can reach out to communities that could use our help if, it's in your, if you have free time. Well worth it, from what I can tell you. Um, I'm going to stop preaching for a second, and I'll, I'll go back to you guys. Um, any, first of all, I'll open it up to the audience, because you guys did not cheat with me with what Devon said and ask questions during this conversation. But OK, Bilal, I can always count on you. I can always count on you.
However, right, we're all in the business of providing access. And right now, you're talking about a period in time when market's going to move sideways. The big money is looking for opportunities to allocate to either private and or late stage pre-IPO companies, but cost of capital is expensive. So why would I go public and some of these new ideas that can go still market share, that can grow into their earnings, that can be attractive investments? Like, what are you guys thinking about that side of the book for clients from an allocation perspective? That's a great question. I mean, that's a big initiative for us this year is not only improving access to private investments and alternatives, but, you know, adding these adjustments into our asset allocations to really integrate the higher expected returns and lower volatilities that we expect from these asset classes. You know, you look at all the capital market assumptions that came out from every firm, right? Everybody's kind of paid to be bullish except JP Morgan this year. I think Naomi alluded to that, like no, no returns, but... Um, you know, like they're all projecting higher rates of return for private credit, real estate, right? Asset classes that aren't publicly traded, they may go public, right? And we're looking at some private credit options for clients right now that um, are institutional grade, right? High quality, but more high quality institutional managers are moving into the retail channel and giving us options to really provide some real value to our clients and something differentiated that they likely haven't seen before, right? To Naomi's point, they may not have had a credit card in the past, and now we're coming at them with this institutional credit manager for a minimum that they can access. I think it feels really good, and it provides a good story for us, for our clients. For sure. Any, I, anyone have? I, I just have a, an anecdote, right? I did just the, if it's just just my two cents in it. Same, same. I, I just did the same thing, right? I the last few years, I thought I'm not putting any more money in these public markets. They're all everything's priced out. I want to get into the, into the, into the private markets and be investing in individual companies, and, and I've been loving it. And it's like I say, it's a great story. Where, you know, you have coffee with someone. Oh, I just, I just bought into this, uh, this little startup, the thing. It's, it's great, right? And it feels great. But it's completely the opposite to that other story I told about the guy who said the fastest pony in the world yep. is, the, is the U.S. public markets. Why? Because everybody's pumping their money into it, every paycheck, every 401k. So that stuff is important. But I almost feel like there's a big PR, a big chunk of you putting someone in an interesting private fund is part of you giving them that story and showing them, and it's valuable that look how good we are as an advisor, look how smart we are, we're showing you these opportunities. But just anecdotally, when things then go a little sideways, those are some of the first things, you know, their valuation might not change because they haven't changed it, but um, there's a lot of risk there. So um, it, it, it's basically quite a top of market thing to start doing the really funky, exotic things, and, and that can be dangerous. Yeah, I, I think that you have to really know what you're doing to be allocating your client's money into some of these private placements. And I think that most people, not most people, a lot of people that are doing so just have no business doing that. Uh, there is a large bet being made. Uh, I think I've seen half a dozen startup wealth tech companies that are trying to uh, bring technology to the private markets. It's a huge pain in the ass to get invested in them. And so they're thinking that technology is just, is the, the fixing the technology will, if you can just make access easier, that there will be dollars waiting lined up to get in. And I'm not saying that that's not going to happen. I, I just don't know. I'm excited to see because that's where a lot of bets are being placed. Like I said, I've seen a lot of these that are chasing our capital in case. And uh, I think think some people might be overestimating the demand from end clients for these assets. Uh, I'm not myself a financial advisor, but I think that if we were not getting clients because we weren't offering these alternatives, I would probably know about it. And uh, we're just, we're not seeing it. So I'm not saying that it doesn't exist. We're not every other firm, but we're not, clients are not banging down our door for private credit or private real estate, despite all of the headlines and money seemingly chasing these asset classes. That's just my experience. Yeah, definitely. Just to add, um, I mean, there's definitely a level of caution that needs to be held when looking at certain new asset classes like the spot Bitcoin ETFs. You know, certain brokerage accounts are not allowing them, other uh, investors, to um, access those uh, leveraged and inverse ETFs. Um, you know, they, they serve a great purpose um, and they can be used for hedging or speculation or investing if 
it is understood that the use case is that it's reset on a daily basis. And that understanding of how the mechanics of that leverage in the ETF works is so paramount. Um, and so there's been a lot of you know, discussions around exactly how to get those communications to not only financial advisors, but then to your clients as to you know, what they could be purchasing through brokerage accounts or retirement accounts. Um, so you know, with all of this great innovation, I think also uh, there's a growing need for you know, just caution. Um, but you know, to everyone else's point, um, it's, it's definitely a smaller allocation, even from in terms of listings. You know, we're seeing um, interesting investments come into the ETF wrapper, but it's definitely still a majority of ETFs are you know, more of your vanilla types of exposures and products. But even just touching on the leverage products, right, we're seeing on a lot of brokerage platforms a need for education coming out, and I think Direction and some others have done a very good job of spreading the word of, hey, you know what, my largest client base is retail. How do I educate them so, you know, regulatory-wise, the SEC, my phone, sorry, guys. The SEC doesn't come chasing after me. But to Luke's point, from a regulatory perspective, eyes are opening now. What else can we do? What else can we launch? What else can we monetize here um, is a question. One last question, and then if anybody else has one more question, I think we have five or ten minutes. Um, for Mike and Jason, this is something where I think in 2023, a lot of conversations and a lot of, I would say, the younger investment community have thought about, hey, why wouldn't I just put my money in a you know, high yield savings product? Or why wouldn't I just go to Betterment or Wealthfront, um, go into their high yield savings product, unlimited transfers, hey, I do it myself, okay? Even though I have a financial advisor, what is stopping um, your financial advisors at your firms maybe from accessing some of those clients? Do you feel like there'll be a trend of that space continuing to grow, the, the robo retail space continuing to grow, or accessing some clients at your firms? Well, you guys have a robo, so you probably, you're on both sides of the. Um, you know, I think that robos will absolutely continue to grow. I mean, I think people are going to do it themselves, right? You know, I think as we think about the value of a financial advisor, right, we are helping people to create a plan to manage their money to achieve their outcomes with certainty. So the with certainty is important, right? We don't know the short-term outcomes of their, you know, investments every, every day or every quarter, every six months, but the long-term effects of their plan, them being able to buy a house, them being able to meet their spending rate, right. right? We want to hit that with certainty, with some level of, we know what's going to happen if we make this allocation or we have this confidence level. Um, so, you know, we continue to find clients have demand for, to get that plan, right? And to have that advice. They don't need us to make their allocation, right? Some of them, take our plan and take the allocation and go buy it because they have access, um, that's fine. But, um, you know, to get the plan, to get the advice alongside of it, we see continued demand. And I think, you know, the firms that have robos are going to continue to provide advice and wrap around services around it because I think it's more about the technology and the access than it is really the advice. I think that robos, and I want to be careful how I say this, I think they were somewhat of a failed experiment. And what I mean by that is just in terms of the ambition uh, and the scale that they hoped to achieve, the betterments and the wealth funds, and we work with betterment and I love betterment, but when Fidelity and Vanguard came in, it was effectively game over for, for them. And I don't think that they're, you know, wealth, wealth front tried to sell the UBS and that deal fell apart for reasons that are not public, but you know. Uh, so I think that they're a great solution for beginning investors. And I think that they've removed a lot of frictions in terms of automated account opening easy, low fee, rebalancing, really everything that somebody needs who is early in their career and who is just focused on uh, saving and investing and betting. Like that, it, it works. It does work really, really well. But the thing is that eventually people are going to need people. And so we bought uh, BlackRock's solution, but we didn't, we're not saying it's, there's people. We have six CFPs that are working with these people. So it's not, these are not robots. A lot of the day-to-day -day stuff is handled by our tech partners, but every single person on the platform has access to one of our six CFPs that are working on the platform. People need people. So it's great, but it's not robo, it's hybrid. And I think that's the future. So hybrid versus robo. Robo is a failed experiment, but having the man behind the machine, man or woman, is probably a better solution. I think so. Awesome. 
I'm going to open it up to the audience. Any questions in the room? Don't be shy. Anything's possible. But I think that when you're competing with the vanguards and fidelities of the world, they just have so much more scale. Uh, so I don't, I think that uh, a lot of these companies have either tried to be acquired or tried to go public. And that's not my opinion. The market has spoken and the market has rejected them. So I think that they've done great things. Well, I should caveat that. Uh, I think Betterman's done great things for their customers. Um, and I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> I just I think that I think that they're just up against the behemoths and it's ants versus elephants. But wouldn't you make the same argument about emerging markets that they are in fact not as important as the elephants? And then how would you think Shots fired. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Now finish your, finish the question. Finish the question, I'm sorry. So I think that some of the nimbleness that emerging, market, emerging managers can have, iShares will never do, Fidelity will never do, and I think that there's massive opportunity between emerging and BlackRock. There's a whole blue ocean of innovation happening, and if your ambition is to get to a trillion dollars, maybe you need to relax, but if you are trying to provide solutions for clients that are innovative, you could create a very, very great life and a very great business. So I don't think that the two are mutually exclusive. I just think that with, with the robos in particular, they raised money for scale. And so when I say it was a failed experiment, that's really the angle that I'm talking about. I think, I think their investors would say, this wasn't a great outcome for us. Yeah, and, and I'd even add, you know, we're a $10 billion asset manager and there's He's an, an ant, but a successful ant. Yeah, but it's, but it's a, there's, a, there's an asset manager at every size. And to your point, like they, we keep hearing these anecdotes. Oh, the you know, iShares were so mad that you guys did that, or you did, you know, whether it's my, we did currency hedging, we did the first A share fund. You know, Crane Shares has the, you know, has K, has the uh, flagship ticker that we don't have to use tickers, but the, we, we have all these great success stories that all these mid level and small companies have because they're nimble. So, they're nimble, they stand out. And, and I was talking to somebody earlier who was, had, was, was talking about the same thing, that everybody's got all the fidelity and BlackRock, and their, their book is 90% that stuff. They're looking for those other managers. So I think it, it doesn't mean that as an emerging manager you can become BlackRock necessarily. That's going to be a, a, a tough, tough road. But to take a chunk, a really material chunk of the portfolio with something innovative, there's definitely room. Just to add to that, I would encourage everyone to also, uh, you know, pay attention to some of the SEC filings that have come out in the past couple of years. There have been 15 proposals in the past uh, that are currently out that could impact the investment community. You know, some of them not always relevant to financial advisors, but um, you know, there is one out called Predictive Analytics, and they're trying to curb how much AI can be used by investment uh, brokers and registered investment advisors. So, um, you know, the industry is not sure what that's going to look like. The, the details were so vague in that, in that proposal, but it could be a hindrance or it could help hinder your competition. But, you know, there's also other proposals out that are going to require registered investment advisors to do even more thorough research on, you know, the indexes and the data and the methodology that the um, products that they use um, are, are utilizing. So, um, you know, I think things like that can be very integral into if robo-advisors continue. Um, you know, from what we're hearing from, you know, the survey participants that we utilize for the retail survey, um, you know, they prefer to have a human behind uh, their investment decisions, especially as um, the larger dollar amounts rise. And that was across generations. You know, I think sometimes that um, people think that robo-advisors are really utilized by the younger generation. But, 
even Gen X wants a human behind their investment decisions, especially when they have more money. And with this huge transfer of wealth that we're expecting, um, Gen, X is, uh, Gen Z's opinion is going to even mean more. And that, I mean, I would say over the last year, while people may not want it, I think that AI was the most asked about or talked about topic with our clients, just asking about how we use it in our own process how the underlying investment managers are using it in their funds, or if they should have more or less exposure to it. Still not quite sure what that means, exposure to AI, but I think we'll learn this year. And, and I would love to comment on this too, because my colleague Paul is sitting in the back, you can ask him this question. We get hundreds of requests a month on people who are launching ETFs. Um, will you be our market maker? Being a market maker is, is not a job that's the most fruitful job at times, right? We want the ETF to be a success so we can make money off of the product. We don't want to do it for free. Um, with this, everybody thinks their idea is a winner. Everyone thinks they're a winner. You know what? We're not all winners in this room, but we're going to always aspire to be. And I'll say this. We've seen some people who've launched a product, um, can't say tickers in this room, I kind of thought the guy was nuts because he's charging over a point for an active product. This is a couple years ago. He raised a billion dollars in year one. So that blue ocean definitely exists. The other thing I would encourage you to think about as we tie it into 2024 is thinking about this globally, right? India is a big market that's also looking at ETFs in a different light. Um, LATAM, think about Mexico right now. It's becoming a part of Mexico's regulations. So pay attention to the global landscape of ETFs and, and the requirements from different pensions, endowments, and government authorities across the globe. Um, I will pause there. Any other questions or any other comments on this panel? Yeah, Paul. But with that, but with that, unwind will come uh, a shrinkage in money markets, and that cash has to go somewhere. So, as allocators, I'm asking you, where do you think the next asset class is that will take some of these trillions out there in short duration in money market funds? Where, where's that going to go over the next year or two? I don't think we're actually going to see it as sharp as unwind as the market's calling for, but the market's pricing it in, and with that, you're going to see some, some, some redeployment of capital. So where do you think that's going over the next year, year and a half? I'll, I'll, go, I'll just go very quick. I agree with you. I don't think it's going to unwind as quickly. Like, I'm, I've, I've, uh, I've got more fixed income than I've ever had, and I'm not, in a, I'm not suddenly wanting to pull it out and put it somewhere else. I'm, I'm quite comfortable with it. Um, I also think the obvious, like, the biggest bucket in the world is probably going to pick up most of those that that risk on money so that core that everybody always puts their money into is probably going to be a beneficiary of that money as, as people are trying to think where should i put it i'm going to take it out of low risk into my risk portfolio is going to be you know your s p 500 so, so again you're not in the wrong place if you're in the obvious stuff and then and then i've told you my favorite idea but that's like a five to ten percent allocation probably uh is, is the carbon markets but that's not going to be a mainstream idea. So that's your favorite. Good luck. That's, 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 that's just favorite. my two cents. The, the CFO of Black, I think it was CFO, uh, one of the executives of BlackRock on their earnings call this week was, last week was talking, was said he, that he's salivating. He wakes up every morning salivating about the $7 trillion of money market funds because he sees it as a huge opportunity for them to, to gather assets. I, I agree with you. I think that you know, whether or not the Fed will cut uh, as much as the market is pricing in is, you know, we'll see. But I think that this, a lot of the money that moved, was it $5 trillion that moved last year? It was some crazy number. A lot of that money was money that is in checking accounts. I don't think that people are selling Apple and going into money market funds. So I think that the money was relatively slow to go in. It really, the dam broke after SVB went down and interest rates went to 4% and then holy shit, 5%, I, got, I can't own nothing. Uh, so I think it was relatively slow to go in and I could be wrong. I suspect it's gonna be slow to come out. I think people forget about it. I think that there will just be inertia. Like, uh, so I think that that's money that moved from, from checking to money markets and I think it's gonna mostly stay there. Uh, but if it does come out, it should be a tailwind for risk assets. Um, we'll see. I'm, I'm very curious to see how that unfolds. Thank you.
Any other questions in the room? Okay, I'm gonna ask one final question because we're almost up on time. Um, thinking about distribution in 2024, you all have a different, a bit of a different perspective on how you run your business, what kind of business you're in. But thinking about distribution and how you want to connect with your clients, Mike, I'll start with you. You, your firm has many ways of connecting with clients. Number one being an amazing podcast that you all host. But what are some new ways and interesting ways that you think that you can connect with clients, not just on an outlook, but just investment health overall? This might sound weird given how much content we create. I think it's really difficult to, to break through, to develop a voice. First of all, I was lucky in the sense that I'm not an advisor, so I can't imagine giving advice full time and creating content full time. It's, it's really difficult. Uh, what I was creating in the beginning was god awful, and it was good because I had no audience and nobody was worth looking at anyway. But there's, there's no payoff. Uh, forget about immediate payoff. Like, there's, there's not even a payoff down the road. I, we, we started our podcast six years ago, and it took just every single week, uh, just relentless, and we, you know, we, we had an audience and built an audience that we built. But how many I, views did you, sorry to interrupt you, but yeah. how many views did you start with, and how many views are you at now? Uh, I, I think uh, we're probably 10 times bigger than we are now than when we first started, okay. at least. Uh, so it's hard, but I, I think that one of the best things about creating content for advisors is the likelihood that you're going to write a blog post and develop an audience and somebody's going to read you and give you your money. That's probably never going to happen, but you can leverage your time. And if you can communicate with 30 clients at once, instead of having the same conversation 30 times, then for that alone, it's well worth your time. So I would encourage people to create content, it's a grind, it's hard. Don't expect it to be a huge payoff, but you never know. Thank you. Yeah, I'd say we, we wanna create meaningful interactions with our clients and prospects through our advisors on our team. Um, you know, we have over 20,000 followers for our firm, so creating content is a way and a strategy for us to try to invite people in to schedule time and talk to us. I think to Mike's point earlier about the human connection, we have the most fruitful connections with people when we meet them and talk to them. A big objective for us this year is to, uh, I mentioned we work with a number of endowment and foundation clients. They have program participants and employees that roll up to that endowment and foundation that we've never interacted with, right? We've only talked to the investment committee. So this year we've got a big push to interact with those groups, work with their employees, work with their program participants, help them create plans and get advice and really grow our word of mouth marketing to those groups by kind of activating the partnerships that we already have. Thank you. And, and I mean, content, we, 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 Crane's chairs, we punch above our weight in content. We, we put out more, you know, when I, I joined the firm three years ago and I couldn't believe that the marketing team was just a machine, just turn, churning out good, but great content, like using the whole firm to deliver this content and is so good. So content is, it gives you that, that multiplier effect but it's so high, but it's still so difficult to like write, to commit to writing a paper every month, which is right, like what, what I do. Special. And, yeah, and, uh, and, and then we have, you know, someone else on the team writes a blog every week on, on climate, and then we have a blog every day on China markets, right, because that's, that's the demand there is for, for that sort of content. But it's, it's incredibly hard. So the hybrid is, is where we think that we optimize it. So we have all that content, and then we use that to build a mailing list and, and a network that then we invite to a real life event like, like this. And we, and we do uh, client round tables. We, we, we get out there and get on the conference circuit and then do side conferences at conferences. And so it's, it's, it's really hard. There's no, there's no shortcut, right? I guess is the, is the, is the main point. You gotta, you gotta do it, it's hard. Yeah, I think uh, figuring out your strengths in content creation and how you can do it most efficiently is the best way to go because it is hard. It's, uh, it's a lot of work. I'm going to use this as a shameless plug. Uh, you guys should subscribe to the NASDAQ ETF newsletter to keep up with lots of the different trends that we're talking about today. Um, but it's super important to get a following because I think even just from my own personal experience, people want to be in a room together now more than ever. And I think in-person events where people are interacting and you're meeting new people, um, are really becoming the, the status quo again post-pandemic. So I think content's a great way to get that following, get that distribution list, and then, you know, have an event like this. 
So I agree with everyone here and, and what you're saying, but I, I will add this. I think that content, although content does, you know, is a multiplier effect, I think everyone on this panel has mentioned this at some point in this conversation, that face-to-face -face interaction and getting somebody to actually like you, <laughs> you can't really replace it. Um, so that's one thing, and I think at GTS, one of the ideas that we implemented was how do we connect with somebody in a different way? So um, we do a ski trip with some of our customers once a year. We do, and I know that Asset Link was there last year, and they've met some people from that. Um, doing activities, having experiences with people that just promote organic conversations. I don't always want to sit across a meeting table from you. Hey, Jason, how are you? No, let's let's cut the BS. Let's go out for a cup of coffee. Let's go for a walk. Go for a hike. Um, a nice way to connect with people, but we encourage you all to reach out to these panelists that were on the stage. So round of applause for these four fabulous people. And please, please, please reach out, add them on LinkedIn, you know, ping them with any questions, myself included, and I'll give it give it back to Devon. Awesome panel. Thank you. Thank you. So this is the reason we created Asset Link. It is damn hard to raise capital. It's even harder to connect with the decision makers for these private wealth managers, registered investment advisors, multifamily offices. The fact of the matter is, this space is expected to go to $230 trillion by 2030. It is more fragments than ever. So the only way to punch above your weight class is you better have a damn good distribution strategy. We're very fortunate that we now have Asset Link. We are bridging the gap between assets and wealth, putting managers, Harbor, Northern Trust, all these emerging managers in here, broker dealers with Broad Street, right? We're connecting everyone in this room to people that, quite frankly, not in a million years you'd be able to get in front of. And we're able to do that at scale in a tech-enabled, cost-effective way. So my ask is simple. If you're raising capital, if you have a strategy that is differentiated, not to, you know, no SPY, SPY doesn't need any help, right? VUO doesn't need any help. If you're truly a differentiated strategy and you're trying to get to penetrate the minds and portfolios of key decision makers, tonight go to assetlink.ai. If you're a financial advisor, registered investment advisor, private wealth advisor, and you're looking not only for differentiated investment solutions, but you're also looking for the accredited investors that are investing in these solutions, and you want top of funnel legion and a way to come to your clients with these solutions, tonight, go to AssetLink. AssetLink.ai for all your distribution, fundraising, and capital introduction needs. So I want to thank the panel. You could find Luke's strategy on AssetLink. You could find Ritholtz on AssetLink. You could find Zenith on AssetLink, and you could find Naomi and GTS's ETFs on AssetLink. We'll work on NASDAQ. We'll see you soon. Um, so really, once again, round of applause for the panel. I really appreciate you all coming out. We're going to try to do this uh, every quarter. You know, we're going to bring some new faces, new names. Um, it can't always be about tech, even though we're very, we're damn proud of, of the tech that we've built. Um, would also like to thank uh, some of Asselink's team members, our Chief Technology Officer, Sir Phil Thomas, our Operations Officer, uh, Lamin Darbo, in the back. Thank you. Thank you for everyone that's invested in us. Thank you, everybody who was early adopters on the platform. And thank you for everyone that is going to join after this. What we've done is the people that have registered, we have, what do we do, Surf? We auto-generated a profile for you. So when you give back, you'll be able to see yourself on AssetLink if you want to claim it and start your fundraising journey and your capital introduction, your lead generation journey tonight. Thank you, everybody.